All right, so it's about nine o'clock in the morning. I'm at Sawtooth Trailhead, getting ready to head up to Monarch Lake today. And then tomorrow, I'm gonna head up to Sawtooth Peak. All right, so here we have the trail junction to Monarch Lake, which is a right turn here. The left-hand side of the trail is gonna take you to Timber Gap, which I have actually never been to before. So I'm really glad I was able to get this spot right here because there are a lot of other spots that are closer to the lake, but those spots don't have shade. And not only that, this spot right here has a nice flat gravelly area and it's actually pretty soft. So let's go ahead and get this tent set up. I have a few camp chores to do. I already got my water filled up and I've got to purify it. Matter of fact, let me go ahead and just purify the water real quick. All right, so off camera, I filled my water up from the lake down there. And because there are marmots all over the place and because you just wanna be safe than sorry, you do not wanna get sick, you wanna purify your water. And I know that there are people who are filter people. I am a chemical person. I have been doing this this way my entire life ever since I was a little kid and I have never gotten sick. So here's what you want to do. You want to take your water. Now I just filled this up from the lake a minute ago and what I have here is my food bag and inside my food bag I have these tablets. Now there are two of them. Now everyone who always asks me about this always says, but Joey don't you hate the iodine taste? And the answer to that is there is a second tablet that you can buy and that second tablet removes the iodine taste. The drawback to these tablets is that they actually take quite a bit of time. Um, so you have to do one and then the other one. So the first one is the germicidal tablets. So let's go ahead and put those tablets inside of the water. And what these tablets are gonna do, they are actually going to purify the water. In other words, they're going to remove or kill bacteria. They are also going to make the water turn a yellow color and they're gonna make the water taste really weird and metallic. What you wanna do is you wanna put your cap on, don't put it all the way on, just put it a little bit on and just kinda of get the water to kinda of seep through a little bit, shaking it up. And then you wanna like kinda of shake it Get those tablets moving and then we're gonna wait 30 minutes after that 30 minutes is done and only after the 30 minutes is done then you will be able to drink water that is purified so what you can see right now is there's a little bit of yellow on the bottom there that is normal that is the way it's supposed to look 
those tablets are going to dissolve in the water and they're going to purify our water so we can drink it. So while we're waiting for the water to purify, let's go ahead and set up the tent. There's a few clouds moving in, but hopefully tomorrow morning will be clear. All right, so we got the tent set up and it's about 30 minutes after I put the germicidal tablets in. And so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the neutralizing tablets. These are the ones that are gonna remove the yellow color and the iodine taste from the water and turn that water into clear, delicious, drinkable water. You know, they say that you're supposed to measure out a certain number of them, but I kind of just do like five or six per gallon. I don't make it an exact science. I don't think it needs to be. And then you put the cap back on and you are now done with your purification system. One of the main advantages to this system is the fact that it takes up hardly any space in your pack and also the fact that it weighs hardly anything. The major disadvantage to this system is the fact that you have to wait so long for your water to purify. And as you can see, right before your eyes, the water abracadabra turns clear. All right, so let me show you what this camp looks like. So this is my campsite right here. As you can see, I did kind of a mediocre guy job, but bear with me, I couldn't really get back there. So this is my food bag. It's an ursac. Um, I don't need an ursac because I have a bear locker, which I'm gonna show you in a second. But let's go ahead and head out to the bear locker. And I'm gonna show you what this place looks like. So the other group that came here, they tried to camp here and they quickly realized that that would be a scorcher. So they migrated over that way. And because they came late in the day, all the good campsites are taken. That right there is the best campsite in my opinion. You can see clearly it is shaded. There are no other campsites that I can see that are shaded like that. And that is because of the fact that you have that overhanging block like that. For what it's worth, it's also closer to Sawtooth Pass. Sawtooth Pass kind of runs up that way. I'll do it tomorrow morning in the dark. It's not a very interesting section of the hike, frankly. But once I get on top of the ridge, I think you're going to be astounded. So, what you're gonna see is that the lake's over here. This is Monarch Lake right here. And there's also on the left-hand side, a outhouse, which is pretty, you know, fancy schmancy for being in the backcountry. And here is the bear locker. And it's really not the bears that you need to worry about here. It's, as I mentioned, the marmots. So all your scented items, including your sunscreen, cologne, perfume for the ladies, it's all gotta be locked up. And I'm sure I'm gonna see marmots here in a second. They're very aggressive. I see them here every time I come here. Let me just quickly show you the lake so you can get an idea of what these campsites look like. Now, as you can see, most people like to camp close to the shore. There's two reasons why I don't do that. One, because everyone else does that, and I always do the opposite thing that everyone else does. Two, because you're closer to the mosquitoes. Three, that tent right there is in the middle of the sun. They are probably dying of heat if they're in there reading a book right now. And I can't think of a fourth one, but I'm sure there is one. I mean, this place is just gorgeous, you know? What I like about this lake is the fact that you have this kind of green area here, and then you have this kind of rubbly, volcanic looking area here with this awesome peak, mineral peak in front of us. A cascade of waterfall right here. You can't really see it from this angle, but Sawtooth is right back there. I guess it's right there. 
I mean, it's just a great campsite. I just love this area. So anyways, I'm gonna go back to the tent and I'm gonna read my book I bring Into the Wild by John, I hope I say his name right, Krakauer? Anyway, I love John Krakauer. Of all the people in the climbing community who've written books, his are hands down my favorite. He is an excellent writer and I love the way he tells stories. So here's a moment right there, you see him? I'll get a close up with my telephoto in a second, but you see how he's like, you see how he's on his feet like that? Look at him, he's pretty big too. I mean, he's the size of like a small dog. That's a big animal. And they're not afraid of humans at all. Look at him. He knows I'm here. He's just licking that rock because there's some like, I mean, I'm guessing there's food on it. Hey buddy. It's a very majestic looking animal. Look at his little nose. Ah, ah. He looks like he's smiling right now. So I've been reading this book called Into the Wild by John Krakauer. I hope I'm saying that right. And I watched this movie when I was very young and it had a very big impact on me because like the central character of the book, Chris McCandless, I also feel this siren song, this calling to come to these wild places. If you don't know the story, Chris McCandless was a white middle-class kid and he felt within himself a lot of inner turmoil, specifically around materialism and social injustice. And although Chris graduated with very high grades and probably could have become a doctor or a lawyer, he chose to cast off all of his material possessions and enter a life of adventure and nomadship. In other words, a hobo life. And his adventures eventually took him to the wilds of Alaska on his great Alaskan odyssey, where he ended up dying of starvation. The reason that I want to bring this story up is number one, because I love Krakauer's writing and I would recommend his other book called Eiger Dreams, where he discusses his ascent of the mountain peak called Devil's Thumb in Alaska, which is a very riveting read. But about this story, I want to talk specifically about this siren song. Now, I've always said that these places are therapeutic and sacred, and I see climbing and hiking as more of a spiritual experience, a meditation than a sport. And I think Chris also felt that way, as do a lot of us. Because the thing is, we all experience this cacophony, this suffocation from the city life, the constant buzzing of notifications in our ears. I just heard Elon Musk is gonna make a chip that's gonna go in the back of your head and allow you to use your mobile device, which he will also enable on Mars. In any case, I think we all crave a simpler life, which is what Chris craved. Now, Chris ended up going to Alaska and ended up dying of starvation. And the reason that I want to talk about Chris specifically is because I think there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from Chris's story. First of all, I want to say that regardless of what you feel about Chris's behavior, he definitely inspired a lot of people to explore the outdoors more. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the naysayers and the people who say, this person was crazy. He had everything going for him. He was a young man. He was smart and yet he chose to go into the wild 
very unprepared. He did not know how to hunt. He did not know how to preserve meat. And most importantly of all, he did not understand the concept of when you cross a river prior to the melt and you attempt to recross that river, that river will be raging. And that is what prevented him from retracing his steps and ultimately led to his death. But I think the reason that I want to talk about that is because when we go into these places, we have to come with a heart that has a certain amount of respect and acknowledge the fact that there is danger in these places. And I think that danger is worth the risk. Let me put it to you this way. What is a wasted life? People say, you know, Chris, he wasted his life. What is a wasted life? Is a wasted life sitting in front of the TV, doing what everyone else does, not taking risks? To me, that's a wasted life. Chris, I think he had a lot of potential, but I think his death was not in vain because he inspired me to go out and explore. And he, ex he inspired others to go out and explore. And I think his spirit lives on in this book and in his movie long after his death. He died in the 90s, and yet people are still talking about him. And I think that spirit is more important than anything else in this world. We are suffocating right now from all the social media and all the other trappings that we have. And if we're not careful, those things are going to kill us. The suicide rates in this country are the highest they've ever been. I think there is therapy in these places. And I think there is a lot we can learn from the story of Chris McCandless and others like him, including Krakauer and his epic ascent of Devil's Thumb.
really call this class two. Alright, so I made it back to my campsite and it's about 9.30 in the morning. So now I'm getting ready to pack up camp and head back home. Just happy that I had such beautiful weather today. All right, so I made it back to my car. So all I gotta do now is unwrap it and head home. All right, so as you can tell, I've made it back to society with all limbs intact. And I wanna go over a couple things with you, the map being one of them. But first, I wanna talk a little bit about the concept of risk mitigation. Now, I believe in risk mitigation, but not risk elimination. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. I want you to be aware of the fact that when you go to the mountains, you are accepting a certain amount of risk just by being there, because these places are inherently dangerous. However, there are things that you can do that will mitigate or lessen that risk. One of those things is to climb in the morning. What you will notice in my videos is typically what I will do is I will hike to a base camp, set up a tent, and then in the morning or in the wee hours of the night, attempt to summit the mountain peak. This is due to safety or risk mitigation. There are several reasons why this is so. The first one has to do with snow. Believe it or not, snow is going to be much harder and easier for your crampons to bite in the morning than in the afternoon. Hence, the chances of you sliding off the mountain are less. The other reason has to do with the sun itself. The sun produces not only radiation that burns your skin, but it also heats your body and causes you to dehydrate much faster than you would in the nighttime or in the morning. Believe it or not, the rate of dehydration is significantly higher at high altitudes than at sea level. And water is very hard to come by on mountain ridges. Another reason has to do with thunderstorms. Now I am not a meteorologist and I do not pretend to understand why this is so, but after decades of hiking and backpacking and climbing in the Sierra Nevada and mountain ranges similar to it, what I can tell you is that for whatever reason, the pattern seems to be in the mornings, the skies are clear and then thunderclouds, if they do form, 
often form in the afternoon. Another reason is due to light. It is significantly easier to route find or to find your way back home or to the base camp with a full day of light in front of you than if you attempt to climb and summit in the afternoon or God forbid, in the evening. Another reason has to do with search and rescue. If you get injured on the mountain, the chances of a successful search and rescue operation occurring are significantly higher in the morning than in the evening for obvious reasons. So as you can see, there are many reasons why it is safer to climb this way. You are free to do whatever you want in this world. I am just going to offer you my opinion. Now I want to talk a little bit about the map. Now what I have here is a map from Tom Harrison of Mineral King. Now this is the map that I'm going to show you, but this is the map that I typically would use for Sequoia and Kings Canyon. However, this map is a little bit more of a higher view. And what I want to see is just the Mineral King region. So hence I'm using this Tom Harrison map. I don't like these Tom Harrison maps because the quality is not very good. They're pretty flimsy, but in this case, it shows me more detail of the area that I want. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at the map and I will show you where I went on this climb. Here we have a map of the Mineral King region. Mineral King is one of the best kept secrets of Seki, but I don't feel bad about blowing up the spot because there are a few natural barriers that are going to deter most normal people from even getting to the trailhead. And the first one is the fact that you will have to drive up an hour and a half on a narrow, windy, and bumpy road called Mineral King Road. And that road has huge cliffs the entire drive with no barriers. Thankfully, this deters any and all tourists from even setting foot on this sacred land. The second one is that there are marmots in this parking area, and those marmots will actually get into your car and damage your vehicle. That is why in the beginning of the video you see me tarping my car. If you do not have your own tarp, you can borrow one from the rangers in the ranger station, but I wouldn't count on them having one for you, so you probably want to bring your own. You do not want to be driving down Mineral King Road with a broken brake line. When it comes to lodging, there is a nearby village called Three Rivers, which is the closest place you can find a hotel or an Airbnb. Although Three Rivers markets itself as a resort town, it's hardly worth the price, and not to mention, every time I've been there, it's never been less than 95 degrees outside. One time, my brother and I stayed there, and it was a waste of money, since all we did was stay indoors with the air conditioner on and go over our gear for the trip. Every time I do a trip in Seki, I always stay at Vasilia. It's about 45 minutes further, but it's a third of the cost, and it has a lot more stores nearby, like Safeways and Denny's. Three Rivers has only one store and a handful of smaller chains like Togo's. So what you want to do is you want to park your car here at the Timber Gap Trailhead. I call this the Sawtooth Trailhead in the video, but I believe the actual official name is the Timber Gap Trailhead. However, I don't want you to get confused because this direction here is Timber Gap and you want to take the trail this way towards Monarch Lakes. You will see that there is a small stream that I cross here in the video and that stream is fairly easy to negotiate. After you get past that section, there is a small area where it is wooded and there are a few mosquitoes. Then you head up some switchbacks here where there's another clearly marked trail junction. You wanna take a left at that trail junction and head towards this way where there are really open and cool looking expansive views. Very quintessential of a Sierra hike if you ask me. Then you end up at Monarch Lake specifically Lower Monarch Lake, which is where all the campsites are. This is where I camped in the video. You will see that my campsite was underneath the overhanging rock, which is the campsite that I would recommend if you stay here. Sawtooth Pass is gained by following a use trail here up a scree slope. Once you get to the top of the pass, 
you are then going to have to follow use trails along a class two route over to Sawtooth Peak. There are no actual trails from here to here, and you will have to do a bit of route finding to find the actual way. Once you get to right about here, you're going to make a left-hand turn up onto the summit, up some class three blocks. In terms of terrain, many sources list this peak as class two, although I would disagree and label it as class three. The way that I think of class three is if you were to break your arm, you would not be able to complete the climb. The way that these rating systems are supposed to work is that you rate the climb by the hardest move, not the average difficulty of the moves as a whole. And the reason for this is because if you can't do the hardest move, that move might only be 10 feet or even five feet for that matter. But if you can't do that one section, you can't do the entire climb. Because the purpose of the rating system is not to inform others of how cool you are, but rather to tell others what kind of difficulty they can expect on the climb. If you're only interested in bragging about your accomplishments, nobody cares that you can climb 513. Call your mother and tell her that you climb 513. I'm telling you, if you bring a macho attitude to the mountains, you might get away with it 99 times in a row, but that 100th time will be the one where you'll start to see out of nowhere clouds appear and the next thing you know there's crackling and sparks flying off the granite blocks and your hair is standing straight up. We'll see how macho you are when there's lightning flashing all around you. You have to understand, if you get hit by lightning, you are going to be dead. Doesn't matter if you're the hottest girl on the planet with 60 million Instagram followers and you have really pretty eyes. Nature doesn't care. If you're six foot five, 250 pounds of muscle, own three yachts, two submarines, a private palace on the island of Tahiti, have a promising career in medicine, and in your spare time you teach youth Bible study and save baby turtles from those little plastic can holders, those things won't matter. You will be dead if you get hit by lightning on top of a mountain ridge. If you don't die immediately from cardiac arrest, then your lifeless body will plummet down all the way 2,000 feet down to the bottom of the cliff. So when I say it's class three, what I mean is class three is the hardest move on the route. It doesn't matter if you're a world-class climber. If you fall and break your collarbone, you are not going to get off of this summit block. And unless you have a helicopter rescue, you are going to die on Sawtooth Peak. Some people say, why do you make such a big deal about these things, Joey? And the reason is because this stuff is life and death. If you get injured in the city, you're minutes away from a hospital. If you get injured on a mountain peak, plan on being dead. Like I told you in the Half Dome safety video, read the books, Accidents in North American Climbing. You think any one of these people in those books woke up and said one day, hmm, I think today would be a good day to die. All I'm saying is that come to these mountains with respect. It doesn't matter if it's class two. It doesn't matter if it's class three. You can still die. And I want you to approach every climb with that mindset. With that, I wish you luck on the climb and look forward to seeing you in the next video.